Today's lecture will focus on pedigree analysis. The objectives of today's lecture are threefold. We'd like to state the meaning and different symbols that you see in a pedigree, such as these, the squares, circles, what do they mean? We'd also like to talk about different types of uh, inheritance patterns. We'll talk about autosomal recessive, and then also autosomal dominant. We'll save sex linkage for a separate lecture. So whenever you talk about human pedigree analysis, there's a bunch of symbols that you want to know. Typically, males are indicated by a square, females are indicated by a circle. Uh, if the sex is not known or not specified, it's indicated by a diamond. And then you could see that if a per person is not affected by a disorder or a mutation, they'll have an open square or an open circle or an open diamond. If they are affected, we'll shade that symbol in. If a person's a carrier, it's indicated by putting a dot in the symbol. Uh, if they're a carrier that doesn't express symptoms, but they may express it later, a vertical line will be placed through the symbol. Uh, and you could look through these other symbols as well. So these are all symbols that you want to know whenever you're looking at a pedigree. So what are basic pedigree patterns, basic inheritance patterns? So there's autosomal recessive. Autosomal meaning that it's occurring on one of the autosomes, so chromosomes 1 through 22. Uh, it's, not, not, it's not occurring, excuse me, the gene's not located uh, on a sex chromosome in this case, so it's not located on X or not located on Y. Recessive meaning that you need two copies of the mutant allele to express the phenotype. The second type is autosomal dominant. Again, autosomal chromosomes 1 through 22. Dominant meaning you only need one copy of the mutant allele to see the expression of the mutation in the individual, to see it in their phenotype. Those are the two we're going to focus on today. Other ones that you'll see in future lectures are X-linked recessive inheritance. In other words, recessive as we just talked about, but X-linked that the chromos or the, excuse me, the mutant uh, allele is actually located on the X chromosome. There's X-linked dominant, where again, it's on the X chromosome, but you only need one copy of the mutant allele to express the phenotype. There's also Y linkage as well. Uh, we're not going to touch upon that much, uh, but there is a lot Y linkage as well. And then finally, we're going to talk about cytoplasmic or mitochondrial inheritance in a future lecture. So, but today we'll let's focus on the first two, autosomal recessive inheritance, autosomal dominant inheritance patterns. When you look at this pedigree, it screams out to you that's autosomal recessive. And the first question you want to ask is why? Why is it autosomal? Why is it recessive? Let's take the first part. When we say, why does this pedigree indicate autosomal inheritance? It does because you see females and males that are both affected by this mutation. If it was sex-linked, on the other hand, you would expect to see a higher proportion of a particular sex expressing that mutation. But here you see it in both sexes, equal proportions. That makes us think it's autosomal. What makes us think it's recessive? Well, what makes us think, think that this mutation is recessive is the fact that you don't see the mutation expressed in one generation, then you see it appear in the next generation. You don't see it in this generation, then you see it again in this generation. This skipping of generations makes you think that it's a recessive inheritance pattern. So autosomal recessive inheritance, if we cross two heterozygotes, uh, remember, autosomal recessive, so if it's autosomal, not going to be an X and Y, right? We're not going to see it there. Uh, if we do this cross, we'll see the typical, you know, one to two to one um, uh, genotypic uh, um, ratios that we expect for this type of uh, cross. So the question is always this, though. What are the phenotypes? So the genotypic ratios are always going to be the same if it's an autosomal inheritance pattern. But, but interpreting the phenotypes from these genotypes will differ whether the inheritance pattern is recessive or dominant. So what are the phenotypes? Well, if we have autosomal recessive inheritance, uh, we can see, let's back up a slide, actually. We see, what are the phenotypes? Well, we would say that only a quarter of these individuals, or this quarter here, is affected by that mutation. Again, it's, it's autosomal recessive. You need two of the copies of the allele, two of the little letters, in other words, to see that recessive phenotype. Okay, so just to summarize, the hallmarks of autosomal recessive are uh, the affected individuals usually have unaffected parents, right? They're carriers, the parents, but you don't see the phenotype. You don't see the mutant phenotype. It's very common to see these autosomal res recessive inheritance patterns uh, persist in uh, families where inbreeding is common. So we have a lot of first cousin marriages, uh, very famous examples with hemophilia and the, um, the royal family of England. They affect either sex, right? Uh, if they're autosomal, they affect either sex. And then the children of two carriers, which we just saw on the previous slide, will have a... Uh, uh, 
25% chance of being effective. Okay, so if we looked at this, let's use the letter A. If we looked at this pedigree, a good uh, question to ask yourself would be, okay, well, what are uh, the genotypes of each of these individuals? It'd be a good test question, all right? So let's look at these. So let's use the letter A. What's the, let's take the easy one first. What's the genotype of the son? Well, if he's affected and it's autosomal recessive, he must be little a, little a. What's the genotype of this daughter? Again, must be little a, little a, if she is affected. What are the genotypes of these parents? Let's look at the, le the next most, most difficult uh, genotype to, to identify. Well, we know that both the mother and the father must be big A, little a. So big A, little a, big A, little a. How do we know that? Well, they each have to have a little a, right, to pass down to make these children. They must. On the other hand, neither of them is affected by this mutation. They're not shaded in. So neither of them can be little a, little a. So hence, if they must have at least one little a and they can't be little a, little a, then they must be big a, little a, each of these parents. A little more difficult scenario is to say, well, what is this offspring here? What is this offspring here? You can see it's a little more difficult because we know they're not little a, little a because they're not shaded in. But are they big A, big A, or big A, little a? Either scenario could result from these parents. And in fact, we don't know what the genotype is here or the genotype is here. And we don't know because they haven't had children of themselves yet. What are some examples of autosomal uh, recessive inheritance uh, in humans? Well, one example is albinism. Another example is cystic fibrosis. These are the foundation websites uh, for each of, these, um, each of these disorders. So if you'd like to read more about them, you can look at them online. Uh, foundation websites are an excellent, uh, um, um, excuse me, an excellent website uh, to identify, to see uh, you know, more information uh, about these types of uh, uh, situations because uh, they're, uh, in fact, uh, you know, written for the general public. Uh, a great website to look at is Online Mendelian Inheritance in Man if you want to have more information uh, about autosomal recessive inheritance patterns in humans in general. So in other words, if you're curious what disorders are passed on via autosomal recessive inheritance, you could look at this website. Uh, in fact, I just realized that these websites are not linked uh, to the foundations, <laughs> but they're linked to these specific disorders on this general uh, online Mendelian Inheritance in Man website. Here's the foundation website I, talk about I, ta I spoke about earlier. So here's the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation website. Uh, you could see that it, it's, it's a very, very nicely laid out. I uh, can't say it's peer-reviewed in the sense of a journal article, but it's the foundation website. Uh, so you could really assume that the information on here has a high chance of being accurate because it's written to support the community of individuals that suffer from cystic fibrosis. Uh, it's written uh, both you know, for the lay person, the non-scientist, as well as the scientist. So it's very clearly laid out. It's an excellent resource if you want to learn more about um, this disorder. Let's turn to the second type of inheritance pattern we want to talk about today, and this is autosomal dominant inheritance. Again, let's split it up. What about this pedigree makes us think autosomal, and what about this pedigree makes us think dominant? Well, let's take the first question. Why is it autosomal? It's autosomal because you see both females and males that are affected by this dis disorder because those symbols are shaded in, and they're shaded in about you know equal frequency. So that makes us think it's autosomal as opposed to sex-linked. What makes us think it's dominant? The fact that we never see this disorder skipping a generation. Whenever you see it persist in the lineage, it's always in every generation. That makes us think it's dominant. And that makes sense because you only need one copy of the mutant allele to express the mutant phenotype. If we do the exact same uh, cross, big A, little a, big A, little a, remember, autosomal dominant, it's not going to be on the sex chromosomes, right? So we're crossing those out. But if we do that cross, we get our same 1 to 2 to 1 genotypic ratio that we usually expect. But again, the question is what are the phenotypes? The genotypic ratio is the same if we're dealing with an autosomal situation. You know, whether it's dominant or recessive doesn't matter. The genotypic ratios are the same, but how you interpret those, what they mean, are very different. So in this case, it's autosomal dominant. Let's focus on the dominant. If it's dominant, you could see that anyone having at least one big A, so these guys and these individuals, will be affected. So in this case, the abnormal phenotype will be three quarters of the children, these top two categories. The little a, little a will be the normal uh, group. 
just to summarize the uh, traits we talked about or the, the characteristics of autosomal dominant inheritance, it affects a person, um, sorry, an affected person usually has at least one affected parent, transmitted by either sex, affects either sex, and then if we cross an affected and unaffected parents, uh, assuming the unaffected person um, is uh, heterozygous, then there's a 50% chance um, of inheriting the trait. If we looked at this, we might say, what are the genotypes of the people in this pedigree? Again, this would be a nice thing to look at. So let's take the uh, easy situation. If we use the letter A again, anyone that's not shaded in, in this case, given that it's autosomal dominant, if they're not shaded in, you know that they have to be little a, little a, right? Because they're not affected. If we look at an individual who is affected, then there's a little bit more interpretation. So if this person's affected, we know they have at least one big A, but they could be big A, big A, or this person could be big A, little a. So what are they? Well, in this case, we know that they have to be, this person, this, this uh, mother, has to be big A, little a. Why? Well, she has to be big A, little a because she has mutant children, right? So she's passing on the big A, but she also has children that are not affected. So she has to be capable of passing on a little a. So those are the types of things that you want to identify here, uh, you know, in this, uh, in this type of pedigree. Examples of autosomal dominant inheritance patterns uh, in humans are uh, situations where we have um, uh, familial hypercholesterolemia, uh, and this is a situation where uh, individuals, you know, pass on a mutation where there's uh, an abnormally high level of cholesterol in the bloodstream. Uh, and you could see that because you could see these aggregations of fatty deposits that occur uh, near their eyes. Another example of, uh, Huntington, excuse me, of autosomal dominant inheritance pattern is Huntington's disease. And this is a situation where uh, one copy of the mutant allele leads to Huntington's disease. Uh, the mutation occurs on chromosome number four. And what this is, is this is a disorder where people don't even know they have this disorder till after childbearing years, you know, typically. So in other words, in their 40s and 50s is when they'll notice uh, that uh, they have this disorder. And unfortunately, Huntington's disease does lead to death in 100% of the cases. And uh, the thing is, is that, you know, you wouldn't know that you passed it on to your children until, you, until after you had children. So this is an interesting situation where you have to think if you have a family history of Huntington's disease and typically you would have, you'd be a heterozygote, so you'd have a 50% chance of passing it on to your children. Uh, if you have a familial inheritance, you have to think, do you want to get tested? Do you want to know, both for yourself, would you want to know of this uh, impending phenotype that's going to be bestowed upon you? And also, would you want to know if you're passing it on to your children? Would it affect whether or not you have children? Again, just questions to consider. So in today's lecture, we covered different types of pedigrees, uh, talked about the symbols, how to interpret a pedigree. We focused on autosomal recessive and autosomal dominant inheritance patterns. In future lectures, we will focus more on sex linkage as well as cytoplasmic inheritance.